So in this talk, I'm going to uh, walk you through the uh, internals of Elasticsearch and how it works. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of interesting things I believe uh, would be very interesting and useful for you, especially the ones from you who are already familiar with Elasticsearch in practice. But even those of you who had a touch of Elasticsearch, uh, I think it would be quite interesting and useful. Uh, so uh, I would like the introduction, maybe a few more words about me. I'm currently an architect uh, at a company called Resolve Systems, where I build uh, an enterprise great uh, automation platform that serves a large enterprise customers. And our tech stack is uh, entirely stepping on the Elk stack um, for which I'm going to talk today. I'm also a software consultant and trainer, and I conduct a performance search, uh, which is aligned with the, the um, latest Elasticsearch uh, certification. But of course, it's not an official. And I'm also one of the guys that helps uh, organize the events of the Bulgarian Java user group. We search, but so we're going to talk about today. I'm going to cover briefly the Elk stack, but it's not a very general intro to do, uh, dive into uh, some specific details on how Elasticsearch works and what is the Elk stack in general. Uh, then I'm going about the Elasticsearch lecture to show you the um, the major architecture of Elastic. Search and how it works in general. I'm going to uh, walk you through the Elasticsearch code base uh, and demonstrate to you how you can write an Elasticsearch in just plugin. Pre processing data into Elasticsearch. Okay, so let's get started. First, let's let's see what, what is the um, recap. So the search and include. Uh, several components. Of course, uh, everything is uh, centered around Elasticsearch, which is the main search engine. Uh, and around it, there is an ecosystem of uh, several applications, uh, uh, such as uh, Elasticsearch, uh, and creating different kinds of visualization. aggregations and statistics, number of different lightweight applications called uh, allow us to uh, inject as they either directly to Dash work is a, a, a number. Uh, ребята, всем привет. It is извините за проблемы. Мы с ними сейчас разбираемся. Я не уверен, что мы сможем их починить. Тем не менее, мы работаем над этим. Мы знаем, что сейчас есть и проблемы со звуком, и проблемы с картинкой. Похоже, это проблемы с интернетом до Мартина. Посмотрим, как пойдет дальше. Uh, но с другой стороны, давайте я с вами немножко поболтаю. Мне очень интересно, а использовал ли кто-нибудь из вас уже Elasticsearch и для чего он его использовал. Кстати, и нормально ли слышно меня? Yeah, right now it was pretty fine. But mm -hmm. I think we should try a little bit longer speech. Okay. No. Yeah. No. It doesn't work. I almost can't hear you. No. Um, hey, Dima. I can't hear you too, Dima, by the way. Что не говорил? Uh -huh. Я думаю, что мы можем That's пока fine. продолжить по-русски, и okay. как только Мартик там вернемся, okay. мы его тут же подключим. Хорошо. Слушай, у тебя есть опыт с эластиком? Uh, Кажется, ты с ним должен был сталкиваться, наверное, как то к вам приходили и спрашивали, что у нас эластик тормозит, <laughs> или сделайте, чтобы работало быстрее. А сейчас у нас uh, вот такая заговорная, что мы не с эластиком работаем. 
То есть... Это понятно, но до... Elastic специфический кусок софта. То есть, например, с который... тем, же, тем же Люсина мы сейчас работаем поглубже. Вот, и мы там чего-то чего находим. Это интересно. Но Elastic же, он такая оберточка вокруг Люсина, достаточно мощная. И подозреваешь, ты, ты с ним вообще не сталкивался, да? А расскажи про Люсин. Ну, как, как про конечно... Люсин тоже... А Люсин, вот вопрос, что, что Люсин тоже очень большой, с одной стороны, а с другой стороны, то есть если есть задача абстрактная, давайте сделаем Люсин лучше. Хорошо, а в каком месте? Вот, и мест таких много, а как бы нам это померить? А как таски сделать? Вот и там. как мерите? Или это коммерческая тайна большая? А, нет, слушай, есть а, некоторое количество бичмарок, они, кстати, почти все не gmh шные вот, с которыми а можно пора поработать. А есть, скажем, а, такие интересные а, Lucene Util бенчмарки, угу. которые <laughs> снаружи, они вообще там... Бенчмарк, написанный на Java, который там, понятно, через, работает через API с Lucene, что-то там делает. И по умолчанию с локальным, но, по-моему, там можно еще настроить, чтобы он удаленно что-то там делал. И обертка вообще на питоне. Ничего вот, себе. Вообще, вообще это забавно. Я, кстати, вот тут вот за последний год не первую встречаю бенчмарк обертку для тестирования чего-то джавовского на питоне. Может, это вообще да, тренд? Я... я не уверен насчет тренда, но я тоже заметил. Некоторое время назад, сколько, наверное, годика два назад, я ходил на собеседование в, ком... в компанию Ingram Microcloud. Ingram Microcloud это единорог, вроде бы, и я подумал, что это само по себе интересно. Еще интереснее, что вообще-то говоря, по жизни я enterprise разработчиком был, а звали меня на позицию performance engineer. Но все понимали, что я какой из меня performance engineer, когда я Ничего, никогда ничем таким не занимался. Ну, если как GMH, GMH-шный тест пишется, я примерно себе представляю. Но даже это мне не особенно часто было в настоящей жизни. Только вот если кому-нибудь показать, что амортизированный лист медленнее реалиста работает. Ну, или я не знаю, еще какую-нибудь фигню мелкую. Это приходится регулярно делать. Да, люди не очень в это... Ну, сейчас уже чаще, но раньше в это вообще не верили. Потому что говорили, ну, смотри, как здесь просто, как бы мы ссылочку перекидываем и все. Вот. И как бы надо доказывать, что иногда поместить что-то в массивчик гораздо быстрее. Окей, так вот, у этих ребят, что интересно, которые сделали мне офер прямо, они сказали, ну ты знаешь, мы не используем никаких традиционных инструментов, у нас вся обвязка для нашего инжиниринга, это тесты, написанные на питоне. Вот, а теперь это, это традиция. Было... Я на самом деле боюсь, что тогда я решил, что... Наверное, я к ним не пойду, в том числе потому, что, а типа, кому этот опыт-то мой понадобится? Окей, у меня есть какой-то доморощенный опыт тестирования перформанса на питоне. И чё, чё, ты, куда я его дену-то потом? А вот теперь ты прям глаза мне открыл. Может, я на самом деле свернул что они не одни такие. Да, кстати, у нас а. тут в чатике народ пишет, что они достаточно интересные задачи ре реализуют на эластике. Я думаю, они поэтому сюда и пришли. Вот, например, да. тот а, Антон в данный момент не для, для организации геоданных эластик и запросов то, точек с кластеризацией. Скажи, а такие возможности не знаешь, что же в Люсине есть? Или это да. именно эластиковская эластика? Да, это точно есть. Вот прямо вот э, гео всякий поиск. Это вот, тут, это вот оно. Это очень интересно. Антон, а это же математика. Э, э, да. Ну там математика достаточно а простая на самом деле. Жаль. Там вообще все внутри устроено довольно, как бы, с технической точки зрения, это не сказать, чтобы очень заумно. У тебя есть куча данных, ну, которых может быть, ну, реально много. Вот они лежат какие-то там, не знаю, данные с точками, еще с чем-то. Ну, просто много. Данные каким-то образом структурированные. Вот тебе нужно по ним искать. Значит, ты эти данные хранишь, как-то запакован, индексируешь. Есть процесс индексации. И потом это, ну, нужно придумать эффективный индекс. Это да, такая задачка. Ну, обычно что-нибудь там где-то сжимается. Да, ну, может быть, Мартин нам об этом что-то расскажет. Давайте мы попробуем еще раз подключить Я его. Мартин, ты здесь? Окей, теперь 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so now uh, you should be able to see uh, from a slightly different angle. Can you move a few slides ahead? Guys, can you hear me? Yeah. So, so. Yeah, if yeah, you now, can. Now, now um, slides look good and uh, you can just yeah. talk. Yeah. If uh, okay, we can go to two slides ahead. Um, so yeah, uh, you can see uh, that these are the main components of the Elasticsearch stack. As we discussed, we have Elasticsearch, which is the full text engine, and there is a system of several uh, quite good applications, I would say, built around Elasticsearch. That is Kibana, which is the main. Uh, that allows us to create aggregate data to provide us uh, mechanisms for, for monitoring and extraction uh, data collectors that we, on machines which are low on resources such as CPU and memory and they provide us the possibility to ingest data um, okay next slide So this pill it provides the main set of recent versions of our Kibana uh, allows us to connect to uh instance and run the user interface and we have a variety of data sources using Okay, next slide. Uh, so Elastics can think of it not only as a, as a, as a web server uh, that allows us to index and search for data, but also as a document-oriented database. So in Elasticsearch, you, we can um, uh, provide a kinds of uh, capabilities which are not present in the Lucy library. You, you might think, why should Lucy directly and install um, a really heavy application like Elasticsearch? Well, the main reason is that Lucy is just a Java library and you need to write an application from scratch in order to be able to, to use Lucy. While Elasticsearch provides a number of core capabilities on top of Lucy, such as uh, enhanced caching, which speeds up drastically the performance of various types of queries. It provides uh, clustering on top of Lucene. This thing that Lucene as a library doesn't provide out of the box. Uh, and this is one, in fact, of the key features that Elasticsearch provides um, as an ecosystem. It also provides a very convenient to use JSON-based REST APIs. Uh, as some have already used probably the um, query language of Elasticsearch. Uh, there is a web server running, which allows us to serve different kinds of queries against Elastics. Okay, next slide. Uh, the basic structure which Elasticsearch uses uh, is the so-called inverted index. And uh, this data structure, in fact, processes documents which are stored on disk in terms of separate files. Uh, one of the other key capabilities is that search can be performed on multiple uh, indexes at once. And furthermore, indexes are uh, documents inside an index can be logically divided per types, which is now deprecated as a Elastic zero zero. And many projects that are dependent on versions of Elasticsearch, which are uh, less than seven zero, uh, might have some uh, extra effort needed to migrate to newer versions of Elasticsearch. This is also one of the scenarios which we had uh, in the project because we, we are constantly upgrading our Elasticsearch stack. Uh, and we had some uh, extra effort to put in in order to uh, move away from this uh, logic separation of types, which is no longer um, promoted as of 7.0. It's eventually deprecated and will be removed in a later version of Elasticsearch. Okay, next slide. Uh, in order to ensure uh, score relevance, Elasticsearch uses uh, several algorithms to calculate relevance score. By default, the algorithm that Elasticsearch uses 
uh, is called TFIDF or term frequency inverse document frequency. It is based on two main factors that calculate relevance for search terms. The first factor is uh, how many times does this search term occur in the document which we index? And the second factor is how many times does this search term occur, acro occur across all documents that are currently indexed uh, in our Elasticsearch index? Based on those two criteria, uh, we can determine uh, how relevant uh, a document is according to the other documents currently indexed. And however, this is not the only possibility that we can uh, use in Elasticsearch. There is also support for other al algorithms we can use to calculate relevance score, but this is the default one. Okay, next slide. Uh, one can think of, uh, okay, we, we are using an inverted index to store um, data in Elasticsearch, but how is that better than, for example, using a relational database? And the thing is that traditional relational database tables uh, also provide indexing capabilities, and they use data structures like B3 indexes or hash table structures to index data which of course provides uh, a need for increased um, memory. Uh, and however, indexes that we can apply in relational database tables pose certain set of limitations on the types of queries that we can write. So this is one of the main benefits of using a data structure uh, like inverted index for search is that we can optimize uh, queries in way more scenarios than, than we can do with regular SQL queries being executed against a relational database table. And that's in fact one of the main benefits why Elasticsearch is used uh, as a full text search engine in preference to a standard relational database table. Okay, next slide. Uh, documents in Elasticsearch might not have an explicit schema uh, as one is required, for example, in a relational database table. However, we can define a schema that defines what are the field types. And certain fields can also match uh, patterns that identify their field type, which is also called dynamic mappings. We can create uh, a definition for a group of fields that have common structure. And also the same field can be indexed multiple times using different data types, for example, in different settings, which allows us to treat uh, a certain document field uh, in different uh, manners when we index it in Elasticsearch. Okay, next slide. In terms of Kibana, as I mentioned earlier, Kibana is um, the tool of preference to work with uh, Elasticsearch. It provides a very convenient developer console, as some of you are already probably using. It also provides a number of additional tools to use to simplify interaction with Elasticsearch, like the possibility to create a really nice visualizations. And it's also browser-based. So when you download Kibana and use it, you need to uh, have the same version of Kibana as it is with Elasticsearch in order to avoid any issues. Okay, next slide. Logstash is uh, one other uh, very widely used in practice component of the Elk stack. Uh, initially, the idea of Logstash was that it's a log collection uh, utility, which was uh, used to provide the possibility to aggregate logs from a variety of sources and aggregate them in Elasticsearch. In that regard, the Elk stack can be deemed as a major competitor uh, of other tools that target uh, log aggregation like Splunk, for example. But in practice, Logstash has expanded to a way larger number of different scenarios other than just log aggregation. For example, Logstash is also used in many applications uh, as a way to integrate with different kinds of third-party systems using the different kinds of plugins that Logstash provides. And Logstash is fairly rich in terms of different integrations that it provides for reading and writing data. Okay, next slide. Uh, Logstash works in a manner of input filter uh, output uh, pipeline. So we have uh, different data sources that are integrated with Logstash in terms of Logstash uh, input plugins. We also have filter plugins that allow us to process the data that we uh, ingest into Logstash and we can output that data into a variety of data sources. One of the most popular type of data source that we can write data from Logstash is of course Elasticsearch. Uh, and as Elasticsearch uh, and also Logstash have a fairly rich ecosystem of plugins, uh, 
there is also a large number of third-party plugins, uh, not only for Logstash, but also for Elasticsearch uh, that we can use to achieve the same purpose. Okay, next slide. Beats, as I mentioned, is a collective set of uh, log shippers uh, that allow us to collect data from uh, different kinds of sources or machines, which are uh, very limited in resources, uh, specifically memory and CPU. Beats applications are very light in, in nature uh, and they are installed separately. And the data that they collect can be uh, placed directly uh, for processing to Logstash or directly to Elasticsearch. Okay, next slide. This is a, a short catalog of some of the uh, BEAT applications that are provided by Elastic. Um, as you can see, some of them, for example, allow us to collect uh, data from log files, uh, which is provided as a capability by the file BEAT application. We can also collect uh, data from system D journals. We can also collect network data. Uh, we can collect data from Windows event logs and a number of others. This is just, just a subset of some of the BIT applications that are provided and can be installed and used separately. Okay, next slide. Uh, XPack uh, is a set of extra features that are provided um, to Elasticsearch. Uh, some of the main features that XPack includes are, for example, the possibility to provide security to Elasticsearch. You don't get uh, things like authentication or SSL out of the box with Elasticsearch. These are provided by uh, the XPAC extension. It's already installed by the Elasticsearch. It needs to be enabled in the Elasticsearch configuration. Uh, and also the different kinds of XPAC features that are provided with the current version of Elasticsearch. It's using that endpoint um, on the Elasticsearch instance, uh, uh, which is get slash um, uh, XPAC. And um, yeah, with this, uh, we we can gain uh, overview part of Elasticsearch. This is really the core Elasticsearch stack. Now we can go into more details and discuss the uh, core architecture of Elasticsearch. Uh, how is Elasticsearch implemented and see some, some interesting details from the Elasticsearch architecture. Next slide. Yeah, one more slide. So uh, Elasticsearch, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is designed with clustering in mind. One of the uh, essential capabilities that Elasticsearch provides is the possibility to scale uh, on a large uh, amount of instances, uh, to have a cluster with large amount of instances and be able to distribute data evenly uh, whenever we add more instances to the cluster. Uh, by default, uh, each node starts uh, with a number of five uh, primary shards. Uh, and each uh, Elasticsearch shard uh, is, in fact, a Lucene index. So in terms of terminology, when we talk about Elasticsearch shards, uh, in fact, Elasticsearch shards are the um, logical uh, structures that keep the documents on the various instances in the Elasticsearch cluster. And below each Elasticsearch chart is, in fact, a Lucene index that uh, keeps hold of the documents that we index. Next slide. The more uh, nodes we add to our Elasticsearch cluster, the more data gets distributed evenly among nodes. Uh, and by default, Elasticsearch tries to balance the number of shards across the nodes so that load is um, spread evenly across the cluster. It's very important to keep in mind that initially when we create indexes in Elasticsearch, we need to specify uh, properly the number of uh, primary shards that we create up front. This is something that we cannot dynamically change. And that's why it's very uh, essential that we put the number uh, correctly at the beginning when we create and index the first documents. We can also put uh, replica shards where data is replicated and they can be also used for search and they can be dynamically changed uh, during uh, the life cycle of, of our uh, Elasticsearch indexes. And also the other thing is that we can also return partial results from Elasticsearch queries, meaning that even if some of the Elasticsearch nodes and charts are uh, down, we can still execute queries and get results from the Elasticsearch cluster. Next slide. Uh, a shard uh, for a document uh, is determined based on the following formula. Uh, so we, we get the routing key um, for the document. 
uh, and uh, this is basically the ID for the document that we index. We take the hash from that routing key and we uh, take um, a module from that based on the number of primary shards which we have in the Elasticsearch cluster. So uh, as I mentioned, also due to that factor, we, can, we need to determine the number of primary shards when we create the index upfront because that's not something we can change dynamically on the fly. So when the, the shard for a particular document is determined, based on that shard number, the document is routed to the proper node in the Elasticsearch cluster, and it gets indexed in the corresponding Lucene index. We can also create custom routing keys, uh, not use the document ID for the document we index. And uh, using custom routing keys, we can also enable so-called uh, shard routing at the level of the Elasticsearch cluster. If we really want to index certain set of documents based on a specific shard, we can define our custom routing key and use that to create so-called uh, shard routing at the level of the Elasticsearch cluster. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so by default, new nodes uh, discover existing clusters via multicast uh, on the network. If a cluster is discovered, the new node joins the cluster only if it has the same cluster name. The cluster name is specified in the Elasticsearch configuration. And if a node of the same instance already runs on the specified uh, Elasticsearch um, port, uh, even though we try to start another uh, Elasticsearch instance on the same node, it tries to get the next available port. So it, it, it doesn't crash with an error that, uh, okay, this port is already taken by another Elasticsearch instance, but it rather runs fine and gets the next available port. Next slide. And there are two ways to discover nodes uh, on a network. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, one that Elasticsearch uses by default is multicast. It tries to automatically discover nodes on the same network by sending a multicast ping uh, to the uh, address, which is 224224 uh, on this port 542328. However, in many networks, it's, it's not excluded that this address is disabled and essentially multicast uh, communication is disabled. For that reason, we can also connect to an existing Elasticsearch cluster by specifying a list of uh, hosts uh, that have Elasticsearch instances from the cluster running. And Elasticsearch tries in order to connect to one of those um, host addresses to connect to an existing Elasticsearch cluster. We need to specify that property statically in the Elasticsearch configuration uh, YAML file, which is called discovery seed hosts. And we, of course, don't need to list all nodes of the Elasticsearch cluster in that property, just a few nodes to which uh, our current instance can connect to the existing cluster. Okay, next slide. When we uh, design our Elasticsearch cluster, we need to take several things uh, as consideration. Uh, we need to take into account the number of primary and replica shards that we specify for our index upfront. Uh, we need to also um, decide how we need to split data uh, between indexes. Uh, this is like designing a database schema for a relational database, but in the same manner, when we design our uh, set of indexes in Elasticsearch, we need to carefully uh, design how to split data among indexes and avoid having either uh, low utilized indexes or very heavy utilized indexes. We also need to consider how we can maximize throughput uh, using different kinds of settings in the Elasticsearch configuration and uh, configuration parameters. Okay, next slide. Uh, several basic guidelines, as I said, Two small number of shards uh, provide scalability bottleneck uh, because the more nodes we add to the cluster, we uh, Elasticsearch won't be able to allocate automatically new shards. The number of primary shards is uh, defined statically when we create the index. Also, too many shards introduce performance and management overhead. So if we, let's say, create up front 100 shards for our uh, index and we anticipate that we have uh, a node, uh, a cluster with not more than five nodes, then this poses uh, performance and bottleneck and management overhead in managing all those uh, shards uh, in the Elasticsearch uh, cluster. 
so yeah, uh, this should be really based on an, on upfront planning, and uh, we should carefully set the number of primary replica shards. Next slide. Another uh, thing to consider uh, when working with Elasticsearch is to avoid putting large amounts of data in a single index. If you have that scenario, uh, you should consider using uh, daily, weekly, or yearly indexes. Uh, for example, if uh, you aggregate enough data uh, for every single day, you can consider using daily indexes. And if you go with that option of using uh, uh, we indexes per, per date, it should be good to work to also create uh, every time aliases to work with uh, uh, those kind of uh, daily indexes in order to avoid changing uh, in your application code uh, the particular uh, index that you're going to use. So there is a high benefit of uh, working with aliases, and that should be the preferred option uh, working with Elasticsearch. Next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, the nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster, we have different roles. We have uh, master nodes, or which are so-called coordinating nodes, which uh, receive the various queries that we uh, execute against the Elasticsearch cluster such as indexing of documents, deletion of documents, uh, different kinds of uh, queries that we execute uh, using the REST-based uh, JSON API. We also have data nodes, which uh, uh, are uh, processing data. They do not receive uh, data for coordination as master nodes, but they are used in the processing of data. Uh, so they perform the actual queries and return results uh, of data, which is local on the particular node. And we have also so-called ingest nodes uh, that we can have in our Elasticsearch cluster. Ingest nodes provide us with the capability to pre-process data before it's actually indexed in the Elasticsearch cluster. Also in uh, newer versions of Elasticsearch, we have uh, also newer types of uh, nodes, such as, for example, machine learning nodes. Machine learning nodes uh, provide us the possibility to execute also machine learning operations against our Elasticsearch indexes. Next slide. In terms of uh, concurrency control, when Elasticsearch uh, executes uh, queries from different clients uh, against the same index, Elasticsearch uh, steps on the technique of optimistic locking. As you know, uh, in some uh, relational and no, uh, no SQL databases, we have the possibility to lock uh, the particular uh, data structures that we use. Uh, however, uh, in Elasticsearch, we don't have uh, the possibility to create pessimistic locks against indexes. Rather, we, we can use, when we index a document, we can specify a version that we expect uh, to have in, a, in the Elasticsearch index for that indexing operation to succeed. If we specify a particular version for a document we want to index, and in the meantime, someone else uh, already manages to index uh, a document um, with the same uh, version, then our index operation fails. And in that regard, Elasticsearch provides us the um, possibility to use optimistic locking for concurrency control when we manage our documents across indexes. Next slide. In terms of high availability, uh, we can create one or more uh, copies of our primary shards, which are called replica shards. Uh, and for the replica shards, uh, the nice thing is that they also participate in uh, different kinds of search requests. So they are not only used as standby uh, shards for used for high availability, but they can also process different kinds of search requests, thus improving performance across the Elasticsearch cluster. And the other nice thing is that we can dynamically change the number of replica shards uh, that are available uh, on our uh, production Elasticsearch cluster. Next slide. When you perform a search request, Elasticsearch distributes uh, the load among shards and replicas. And as I mentioned, this improves uh, performance drastically. So um, nodes are replica, sh nodes, replica shards are not used only for uh, high availability, but also to improve uh, search performance. And initially we specify uh, some initial number of replica shards when we create our index, but then we can dynamically change that. Next slide. 
In some cases, uh, going with uh, replication and replica shards is not uh, sufficient enough to uh, provide uh, a decent level of high availability. In that case, we have extra features like cluster, cluster backup and restore capabilities provided by Elasticsearch, or even cross-cluster replication if you have if we have uh, geographically distributed uh, clusters which we want to interconnect. Uh, some of these features that allow us to provide extra high availability capabilities are part of the enterprise suite of Elasticsearch, not uh, in the free uh, or open source versions of Elasticsearch. Uh, but in, in certain scenarios, they are really needed to ensure higher level of uh, high availability uh, in our Elasticsearch cluster. Next slide. Uh, in that regard, uh, there are several uh, guidelines that everyone needs to keep in mind when uh, he runs Elasticsearch in production. Uh, we need to allocate enough memory for our Elasticsearch nodes. Uh, typically, uh, the best would be between 32 and 64 gigabytes per instance. We should also prefer uh, CPUs with more cores than faster CPUs, as Elasticsearch internally utilizes uh, uh, different thread pools that allow us to uh, allow Elasticsearch instances to scale uh, vertically on a single instance. Uh, also, we, we need to prefer, that's uh, really a general guideline for many applications, but it also applies for Elasticsearch to run uh, Elasticsearch uh, on faster storage um, and you make use of SSDs if possible. Uh, no need to, uh, to leverage RAID-based mirroring and parity in terms of shard replication because clustering mechanism in Elasticsearch is robust enough uh, to provide us with failover uh, capabilities. And also, of course, if we run an Elasticsearch cluster, we should prefer uh, using a faster network. Next slide. This is the relationship between Elasticsearch and Lucene. So we have an Elasticsearch index that constitutes of uh, one or more shards which are uh, spread across the uh, Elasticsearch instances in the cluster. Uh, some of those shards are, are primary shards, some are replica shards, but every shard, Elasticsearch shard, is in fact a Lucene index. Lucene index is the main uh, structure that is used to, to index and process documents in Lucene. And physically, each, each Lucene index uh, constitutes of one, one or more Lucene segments, which are uh, the physical storage of our documents on the disk. So one Lucene index is in fact uh, contains one or more Lucene segments on the disk. And one of the extra features that Elasticsearch provides is the ability to uh, manage those Lucene segments over time by, for example, merging smaller segments into larger ones and thus keeping management overhead of the, of the segments lo as low as possible. Next slide. Uh, on this uh, diagram, uh, you can see how we process a request uh, in an Elasticsearch cluster. So uh, assuming that we have uh, a request to uh, index a document, this request gets sent first to the coordinating node in the Elasticsearch cluster, which is marked as a master node. Uh, it then routes the request to all the shards for that index, which are spread across the eventually other instances in, in the Elasticsearch cluster. In each shard or in each instance of Elasticsearch, uh, the request goes first to uh, two in-memory structures, which are the memory buffer and the transaction lock. And the document is not indexed right away. It's not available right away in search queries. First, there is a period of... Um, uh, uh, by default uh, of um, several seconds, by default that's five seconds when um, data from the memory buffer uh, gets um, freshed out uh, to the file system cache and then on the disk. And there is a certain period be between the uh, time when the document gets indexed and when it gets refreshed, so it's available in search, search queries. We can, of course, also explicitly force refresh there is a refresh API provided by Elasticsearch that we can use to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to write data to the disk. Uh, and uh, when that happens, uh, we can also we can see the documents from uh, Elasticsearch available already. Uh, the transaction lock is another structure that, that's used by Elasticsearch. 
uh, and it gets filled up with uh, information about all the uh, queries that we execute on the instance. The transaction lock uh, is also used for recovery purposes. And over time, it gets also flushed uh, on the disk uh, of the Elasticsearch instance. So this is how uh, eventually uh, every uh, request going against the Elasticsearch cluster gets processed. Next slide. Uh, when we execute a search request, on the other hand, what happens first is that uh, first uh, we uh, get uh, a query phase that gets executed. Uh, the query phase, uh, what it does basically it just uh, goes to the coordinating node and executes uh, the query against all the shards in the Elasticsearch cluster. We get uh, the documents that match the um, the query, but not the full information about the documents, just uh, the IDs of the documents. Those IDs get returned by the coordinating node, which further filters them out. And then on the fetch phase, we uh, get the data for all the documents across the shards uh, and return them again to the coordinating node. And from there, back to the client that executes the search request. So every search request goes through those two phases, which is first to query and retrieve the documents that match uh, a query, and then to get the actual data for those documents and return it to the client. Next slide. Internally, uh, the implementation of Elasticsearch uh, is comprised of different modules. And modules are defined in terms of Google JICE framework. Uh, so Elasticsearch is stepping on a custom version of Google JICE for loading of different kinds of modules that Elasticsearch uh, uses. And all of those modules are loaded when Elasticsearch server instance starts up. So uh, this basically allows uh, Elastic, this clear separation of, and modularization of the Elasticsearch code base, uh, provides the possibility for uh, Elasticsearch to provide that many, that high number of capabilities in a re relatively isolated uh, and independent manner. So when we start Elasticsearch, the first, uh, the entry point for Elasticsearch is the Oracle Elasticsearch Bootstrap Elasticsearch class, which loads all the modules uh, by creating uh, an instance of Oracle Elasticsearch node node. And in fact, that node instance is a representation of the Elasticsearch uh, node on the target machine. Next slide. Uh, this is just an excerpt of how, uh, during startup of Elasticsearch, we bind the different kinds of modules uh, using uh, Google JICE. Uh, here on this excerpt, we can see some uh, core modules like, for example, the plugin service, which allows us to manage the various plugins that we uh, install uh, and use in Elasticsearch. We have the node service, which allows provides management for the various nodes of the Elasticsearch cluster. We also have modules that provide the different thread pools that Elasticsearch uses uh, and a number of others. And all of those are bound during startup with Elasticsearch. Next slide. Some of the uh, core modules that, that are provided by Elasticsearch are the discovery and cluster formation, which is responsible to, uh, to manage the communication across um, uh, uh, the cluster nodes in terms of discovering the various nodes using either unicast or multicast communication. We ha also have HTTP module that provides the REST-based uh, endpoint of Elasticsearch. We have the plugins module that is responsible to manage plugins. We have thread pools module. We have transport module, which is uh, the communication layer uh, which Elasticsearch provides between the various nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster. And we have a large number of other modules which are also uh, implemented by the Elasticsearch server. The Elasticsearch documentation provides a good reference of all the modules that are available um, in Elasticsearch. Next slide. Now, uh, I, I have a demo um, I wanted to show you. Maybe I, I'll be describe briefly what's the project structure of Elasticsearch. Um, maybe we can pause for to see if we have some questions until now. Tak. Pasha, if you're yeah. on the call, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm on the call. 
yeah and i can hear you Dima? yeah uh maybe if we can have some questions from the audience or from yeah. yourself maybe we, uh, we can have a short uh one or two questions maybe one question Pasha, what do you think yeah. and then yeah uh i had one one question uh in the very beginning of presentation, Martin was talking about Logstash, and I had not too good experience with Logstash. It had uh, massive losses of log items, so we had to replace Logstash with uh, Kafka. We were writing mm -hmm. our logs to Kafka in specific formal, in special format, and then Kafka was streaming events right into Elasticsearch, and it was mm -hmm. working pretty good. What do you think about it? Yep. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of uh, reliability and data loss, um, probably Logstash is not the best option to go. Um, although, it, it, for example, Logstash doesn't have uh, built-in cap clustering capabilities. So if you, if you want uh, to run multiple Logstash instances, they are basically stateless and you, you need to run them on separate machines and make sure that you coordinate them properly somehow through Elasticsearch and so on. If you want to have that kind of uh, coordination, then Logstash is probably not the best option to go. One of the key features, I believe, for Logstash uh, is the large amount of integrations it provides. So it also provides integration with Kafka as well. And there is also a large number of community contributed plugins for Logstash that, that can be used. So uh, in the particular, in the scenario uh, that we are using um, in my current project, Logstash, it's in fact used as the main integration facade for a large number of third-party systems that, um, that our application integrates with. And we, we don't need to consider writing any extra code to integrate with those systems because Logstash already provides a very rich set of plugins. Um, okay, but why Logstash and not Apache Camel, which is tool of choice for integration? Yeah, well, it's possible, of course. Uh, so many applications step on, on Logstash because it, it provides uh, really tight integration with Elasticsearch and there are a lot of standard practices and guidelines on how you can organize your topology with an Elasticsearch cluster and around it have a number of Logstash instances and also eventually some bit applications. So there are some good set of standard guidelines on how you can organize your cluster using Logstash and Elasticsearch. If you use uh, uh, something like Spring Integration, for example, through an external application or Apache Camel, it's also possible that you put it uh, directly um, with, in communication with Elasticsearch and not grow through Logstash. Uh, and it's perfectly fine uh, as long as it provides better capabilities for your use case. In fact, many applications are really not depending on anything else than Elasticsearch. As I said so. at the beginning, yeah, Logstash is initially targeted to be a log aggregation framework, but eventually it grew into way more scenarios than initially anticipated. Thank you. We, we, we can uh, make a short uh, switch uh, to discussion here uh, and mm -hmm. cut off Martin for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll try to switch and do a demo in a while. So Martin, uh, we are waiting you back. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Just give me a second. Да. Uh, ну, собственно, мы на чем прервали обсуждение uh, до этого, ну, в прыгнем. такой технической паузе. В принципе, Мартин к этому и подошел сразу, да, что uh, как мы, мы работаем с индексами, которые распределены на разные машины. И очень был интересный момент, мне показалось, что да, два типа задач, это когда мы вбрасываем новые там документы или какие-то элементы, которые мы сохраняем, и нам нужно там проводить индексирование, и другое это, собственно, сами запросы. Вот, кстати, Паш, твои практики, как по уровню нагрузки соотносятся эти две части? Как бы что больше создает ну... проблем? У меня на самом деле были проблемы с обоих концов в Elasticsearch, потому что я решал две очень разных задачи. Я, с одной стороны, решал очень популярную задачу лог агрегации логов, и там у тебя в какой-то момент шарды перестают справляться. Ноды начинают тормозить, и 
чтение тоже начинает тормозить просто из-за того, что у тебя тормозят ноды. Вот у тебя как по гайдлайну выделено на них 32 гигабайта памяти, еще 32 гигабайта свободно под офкип, и все равно тормозит. И как бы это больно и тяжело, но ты так или иначе с этим справляешься. Например, идешь к людям и просишь, ребята, выключите, пожалуйста, дебаг-логи. Я не шучу, это иногда то самое решение, которое... В 10 раз, да? Не в 10, но мы видели очень заметный джоб, когда кто-нибудь выключал дебаг-логи. В том числе мы сами были первыми, кто выключил у себя дебаг-логи. После этого логов в 4 раза точно меньше стало. то, что мы. Я очень люблю хорошее логирование. Оно хорошо помогает решать проблемы. Вот, но... Еще я решал совсем другую задачу. Еще я решал проблему... Вот у нас есть Marketplace, на котором садится много-много магазинчиков всяких. И товаров на нем тоже много. И у них есть очень разные наборы характеристик. То есть прям этих характеристик могут быть десятки. И нам нужен очень разный поиск. Например, представляешь себе Яндекс.Маркет? Вот на Яндекс.Маркете обычно есть галочки всякие, я не знаю, рейнджи. И еще у них есть поиск с учетом опечаток. Ну, да. И вот мы да. хотели сделать очень похожую штуку в поисковой строке, и вообще-то говоря, и вообще-то а. говоря, неплохо с этим справились. То есть, как бы мы искали с учетом ошибок. Дальше мы можем судить чуть позже. Давайте попробуем посмотреть. Да, дальше. давайте попробуем сейчас переключиться на демо. Мартин? Онлайн? Да, я Just before we continue with the demo, um, several questions from the audience. Uh, first uh, is, could you say a few words about the difference between Zoller and Elasticsearch? Uh, this is something, in fact, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but uh, Zoller, I would say, is one of the, uh, currently on the market, one of the main competitors of Elasticsearch. And it's also a very, uh, uh, very rich in terms of capabilities, full text search engine. Uh, Personally, me, I haven't used Zoller uh, in, a, in a project, but based on, on some research I had, um, many companies are preferring in recent years Elasticsearch due to the increased amount of features. I believe Elasticsearch now is, uh, is covering more use cases than Zoller. Uh, it's going beyond uh, a full text search. For example, there are many projects uh, that are using Elasticsearch as a NoSQL database not really as a document, uh, uh, full text document search engine, but just as a NoSQL database, that's way faster than, for example, a regular uh, relational database. So in that regard, uh, I would say currently, uh, Elasticsearch is taking a uh, bigger pie on the market than Zoller, uh, but it's still a really good competitor. Uh, I would say Elasticsearch is more feature rich than Zoller. Um, another question, uh, there is, um, So, one uh, from the audience, we have a question that, uh, well, the general understanding is that Elasticsearch uses coordination node for processing of requests as proxy. Is it a bottleneck in, bottleneck in searching uh, request processing? Well, it depends. Depends on how many master nodes you have in your Elasticsearch cluster. If it's just one master node and all the other instances in the Elasticsearch cluster are data nodes, yes, it will be a bottleneck because everything will go through that master node. However, if you have, uh, let's say, 50-50, for example, you have half of the nodes as uh, master nodes and the other as data nodes, and you can also combine them, then you can, you can distribute the execution and coordination of queries across different master nodes in the Elasticsearch uh, cluster. So it will be bottleneck if you don't have Elastic enough uh, master nodes for your application to use. Um, Another question which we have is, uh, can you recommend good resources for developers that plan to use the Elk stack, best practices and so on? So the main source of truth, I would say, uh, is the Elasticsearch documentation, which is very rich. Uh, I can open the browser just to show you briefly uh, that it's really easy to use and to navigate across the Elasticsearch documentation. And uh, we have a really, Uh, okay, let me just open the uh, reference guide for the latest documentation. Uh, one of the nice things in how I search, I just expand all the sections and search for a particular term. But for example, uh, if, you, if we try to look, for example, how we can execute a match query, uh, 
uh, which is a very basic query. In the examples here, you can just copy this example directly or click here, view in console, and that will display the example directly in Kibana and you can execute it right away. So it's very easy to start and play around with the examples in the Elasticsearch documentation. Also, there is a quite a good resource of books available for Elasticsearch. There is plenty of books available uh, written on the Elk stack. Uh, some of them are better than the others, of course, but there are really several very good books uh, to review. But I believe the Elasticsearch documentation alone is uh, good enough. Um, another question is um, uh, if we want to compare, how can we compare Elasticsearch with alternative solutions to store uh, and search logs? For example, uh, now the example given is uh, ClickHouse. I, I haven't used that one. I can give a short perspective with Splunk. So Splunk, uh, many people go with Splunk because it's also really targeting the niche of uh, log aggregation and searching. It provides its own very powerful query language to search among log entries. Um, and really Splunk is very specifically targeted for that area of log aggregation and search. So if, if uh, that's something really specific, I, I believe that for the majority of scenarios, both Elasticsearch and Splunk serve a really good purpose. But if you really need some more specific uh, preferences, like for example, some preference on the query language being used by one of the two or uh, some other features which, which are missing from the other, there is always a need to compare the solutions based on the capabilities. For Elasticsearch, there is a good, a very good summary page uh, on the various features that Elasticsearch provides. So you can just go, go to the documentation, review those features and see if something is missing from an alternative solution that you want to compare against. Uh, it's always a matter of trying to evaluate against another alternative that you would like to use. Um, um, so yeah, those are the questions. Now we can switch to the demo. Um, guys, can you see my screen very well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch to Eclipse, so what I have here. Um, first, I'm going to show you how is the Elasticsearch code base structured, and then I'm going to demonstrate how you can build a, a very simple ingest plugin and deploy it uh, into Elasticsearch and play around with it. So I've cloned the um, open source version of Elasticsearch, which is available in GitHub, and uh, you can review. It provides basically the major functionalities of Elasticsearch, excluding, of course, the enterprise features which Elasticsearch provides. In terms of the structure of that code repository, uh, we have in the client folder, in the root, we have the implementation of the Java-based Elasticsearch uh, clients, which is the high-level and the low-level REST clients, which allow us to integrate with Elasticsearch uh, uh, through our Java applications. I would also recommend that if you want to interact with Elasticsearch to go with the uh, Spring Elasticsearch implementation, which is quite nice. It provides implementation of, uh, of, uh, of a Spring data repository for Elasticsearch, and you can directly work with uh, Java modules for interacting with Elasticsearch indexes. But uh, you can also go directly with the REST clients provided uh, uh, by Elasticsearch. The distribution directory provides the various Gradle build scripts uh, that allow us to build the Elasticsearch distribution. Uh, Elasticsearch at present is built with Gradle. Um, we have also in the modules and the plugins directory some extra modules and plugins that are shipped with Elasticsearch and you can review their implementation. Uh, for example, we, we have implementation for uh, certain languages that we can use uh, as script languages in our Elasticsearch queries such as Mustache and Painless. These are some languages that are used uh, by Elasticsearch as templating and uh, scripting languages. Um, the actual server implementation, the Elasticsearch server implementation uh, is uh, implemented as part of the server directory. And if we uh, navigate inside, uh, we can see how it is structured in the, the main packages, uh, Orc, Elasticsearch, and then we have the implementation of the various modules here by directories. It's structured very cleanly. We have, for example, the HTTP module, which provides uh, uh, the uh, implementation of the REST-based JSON interface. We have uh, discovery and clustering modules, and so on and so forth. In the actual uh, build Gradle file of uh, Elasticsearch, you can see that we have a number of dependencies to Lucene as a library. 
uh, and uh, the particular version of Elasticsearch depends on the particular version of Lucene. Uh, now, you, let's look, for example, at uh, what's the interaction between Elasticsearch and Lucene in terms of how um, uh, Elasticsearch uses um, Lucene behind the scenes. So, the main class that Elasticsearch uses, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is called Search. This uh, basically it serves as a command that uh, gets executed. If we scroll down, we call a main method here. This method is defined in the parent command class, which calls this execute method. Inside the execute method, uh, we call another class which initializes the node instance of Elasticsearch. And uh, let's see what it does. So here, uh, if we scroll down a bit, we can see that we call the init method, which calls another init, which calls bootstrap init. In the bootstrap class, we use the initialization, and inside the bootstrap class, we call the start method, which calls node.start. This node instance we created in the init method of the bootstrap class. Uh, and uh, if we open the node um, class to see what does it provide, inside the constructor of the node class, uh, here, if we scroll up a bit, inside it, it contains a lot of initialization logic. And here inside the constructor of the node, we bind all the modules of the Elasticsearch instance here. This B variable is an instance of a Google JIS binder, which binds all the modules of the Elasticsearch instance. Uh, and they are then started. In the node class, we also have a start method, which starts the various services like snapshot service, for example, which is, provides us the possibility to create snapshots from our data. The indices service, which allows us, provides the capabilities for indexing of documents and all the various other services uh, in Elasticsearch. Now, if we want to see what's the interaction actually between Elasticsearch and Lucene uh, as a library, we can, what we can do, we can uh, track uh, how this gets executed, for example, through the search service. Uh, now let's let's go for example and see uh, what does the search service do. Uh, so inside the search service, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, methods that we can use to um, to call the Dulcine uh, API. We'll follow a quick track on what the search service is doing and how does it interact with Lucene. Um, the search service, what it does, it provides a method execute query phase, which triggers the query phase. Uh, inside the execute method, we create uh, an index chart instance. So this index chart instance basically is a reference to the uh, target chart on this instance that is used to execute the, the query. If we open the uh, index chart instance, inside the index chart instance, uh, we have a number of methods that uh, we can call. So uh, in particular, uh, we can call any of the apply methods to apply the index operation. The index chart might be either a primary or a replica chart. So if it's a primary chart, the apply index operation on primary gets called. Uh, and what it does, it calls uh, apply index operation. Uh, inside apply index operation, uh, we do several things and we finally call the index method from the same class. Uh, the index method calls engine uh, index to perform the actual uh, indexing of the data. Uh, engine index is an abstract class. It has an implementation used by the Elasticsearch uh, server, which is called internal engine. And inside the internal engine, if we look into the implementation of the index method, it first gets some lock to make sure that uh, this is um, this is a thread safe operation. 
Uh, and if we scroll down a bit, what this uh, index class uh, is doing, it's uh, calling an operation to uh, index the data to Lucene. So it's uh, this method, index into Lucene, that gets called. And index into Lucene, uh, further it does some processing on the uh, documents. It first checks whether we have the existing document and calls the update docs method. If it's a new document called add docs method, get docs method, what it does, it uses the uh, index writer class from the Lucene API to index the actual document behind the scenes. So as you can see, all of the uh, major operations related to indexing refer to Lucene APIs to perform the actual indexing of the documents. Now, we are not going to delve more into the Elasticsearch code base. Uh, I think that was a, a very brief uh, overview on how Elasticsearch works in general. Now, let's see how we can eventually implement a plugin in Elasticsearch. All plugins that we implement uh, as separate Java projects need to extend from the um, plugin uh, class, which is part of, the, again, the Elasticsearch server code base. And for each specific type of plugin, we have uh, subclasses. For example, if we want to implement a plugin that provides different kind of uh, ingest capabilities, which I'm going to demonstrate in a few seconds, we, can, we need to extend the ingest plugin class. If we want to provide the possibility to discover Elasticsearch nodes in a custom manner, we can implement uh, the extended discovery plugin class and so on. If we want to provide, for example, enhanced search capabilities uh, on top of what Elasticsearch provides, we can uh, extend the search plugin class. Now, I have a very um, basic filter ingest plugin. So in the filter ingest plugin, in the POM file, I depend on uh, Elasticsearch, uh, not really the very latest version, but uh, 7.6.0, which is relatively new version of Elasticsearch. And this provides me with the capability to use the Elasticsearch API. The scope here is provided. Uh, also, what I need to define as part of my plugin is a plugin descriptor. I put that plugin descriptor in a plugin descriptor properties file. Uh, the plugin needs to have uh, uh, description version to Elasticsearch. It needs to provide a uh, uh, plugin class. This is the fully, fully qualified class name of my plugin, uh, and so on. Now, this directory, I build it with Maven and assemble it in a zip file for my plugin. And, and this assembly done by Maven is performed by a separate plugin XML uh, file, which basically does the assembly of my uh, Elasticsearch plugin, uh, including this descriptor file along with the compiled sources. Now my plugin is fairly simple. Um, I have one class which is called filter ingest plugin which extends plugin and implements the ingest plugin interface because I'm going to provide an ingest plugin that allows me the, to filter out words on documents on documents I, I'm indexing to Elasticsearch. So the way it works I'm registering an ingest into Elastic documents against a particular index that has this ingest plugin ingest pipeline enabled. It uses the plugin here in the processor. I register uh, preprocess my documents. In that particular case, I have one preprocessor which is implemented by the class word uh, preprocessor processor. If I open that processor, it extends the class abstract processor, which comes from the Elasticsearch API. Uh, here, uh, as arguments to my processor, I specify the filter word, which is the word I want to filter out from my documents before they are indexed. And the fields, this is the target field where uh, the, the uh, pipeline is filtering uh, the filter word from the document. This, is, this field is filled from the document I'm indexing. In the execute method of, of that processor, what I do, I get the particular value from that field of the document I'm indexing. I replace uh, all the uh, matches of that filter word that I'm specifying, and I, I set a new value for, for the field. And then I return the new version of the document, which is an instance of ingest document. Uh, uh, okay, so 
that's my uh, plugin. Now, when I implement the plugin, uh, what I need to do, I need a, a Maven. I'm going to say Maven clean install. Short amount of time to build. The plugin, uh, I get a new uh, uh, ZF in my, my plugin. Inside of it, it contains the plugin descriptor and the jar file for my uh, plugin. Now I need to go to my Elasticsearch instance and install the plugin. Uh, there is a utility called Elasticsearch plugins, which allows me to manage the various types of plugins. Now I don't have any plugins installed already. To install one, I can uh, simply call um, Elasticsearch plugin install. Going to do that. Something that needs to be done for plugins is to allow search instance or start it if it's not already started. Now, start in the plugin that I just installed. So, I'm going to start Kibana, which takes a um, second. Just first wait. Oh, okay. It should be enough for uh, finishing the demo. Now, as well. When uh, Kibana starts up, by default, it starts on port 5601, um, which we can just open from the browser directly. Okay, it's still not started. Okay, once we start Kibana, we are going to use the developer console to create a pipeline from our plugin and ingest pipeline. For that reason, I'm going to open the uh, develop developer console uh here so the thing first thing i'm going to do uh and i'll show it really briefly is to uh, create the ingest pipeline so the ingest pipeline i created uh, using the ingest api i'm going to filter the crap word from the the um, description field of the documents i'm going to index so i'm going to create that processor here but then i'm sorry, going to so, index sorry for one. interruption uh but uh we are running out of time Probably yep. you can finish the demo in QA session Zoom as it will probably let you do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that, that's pretty much the demo. So I'm just creating one document and then which contains the crap keyword. And then uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, query that document. Okay. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have QA session important. right now. Uh, thank you, yeah. Martin. Thank you, Pasha. Thank you. Uh, that was the. We have some questions Zoom, left. Yeah. yeah, see you in Zoom. Uh, Zoom link is in uh, chat for this chat. Uh, slot. Okay, okay. now let's switch to Zoom and finish anything yeah. left. Um, that was pretty much the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.